Okay, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, Jim Wonderman here, President and CEO of the Bay Area Council, and welcome to our latest installment of Bay Area Impact. I think we all know that California is facing nothing short of an existential crisis. Uh, we've seen millions of workers just over the last few months lose their jobs. Some are coming back, but we know that many of these jobs will not ever return. We're seeing literally thousands of businesses close their do doors. Uh, and many of those won't reopen. The state, uh, as a result, uh, partly as a result of this, uh, is swimming in red ink, uh, huge fiscal deficits. Uh, the same is happening at the local level. And uh, this is happening both from the economic uh, shutdown uh, that we are experiencing, but another factor is certainly the continuing rising costs of ret retirement costs for the state of California and public employees pensions and other obligations that we've entered into that uh, over time, it's not just from this pandemic uh, that we've been witnessing uh, going up and up and up and forcing the hand of local government to sacrifice services. So we're going to talk about that today as we talk about the issue of tax increases. So just to make matters worse, uh, we are awash in tax proposals in California. It seems odd to me and many of us that this would be happening because it seems like the worst thing you could do when you're facing a cri an economic crisis is to raise taxes on business. Uh, and yet that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing at the state level, we've got a major uh, measure on Proposition 15 uh, in a few weeks in the November ballot, but we've also seen a lot of proposals uh, come before the state legislature uh, to raise taxes in all different kinds of ways, including upping the personal income tax uh, much further, which is already by far the highest in the country. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about that today and other forms of taxation. Uh, we have 34 general tax measures on the ballot in the Bay Area coming up in November. Let me repeat, 34 local governments uh, will be asking their voters to vote for general tax increases, which require only a 50% vote, not a two thirds vote. And we believe that a huge portion of that pressure is coming from these increases in retirement costs, which are, which are really out of control. Um, so this is, a, we think, is a, a massive disincentive for business to invest and create jobs just at the time when economic recovery should be first and foremost in our state. So we're very, very concerned about this. And today's, uh, today's uh, impact uh, installment uh, on taxes is really all about this and what's actually happening and what are the driving factors and, of course, what it is we can do about it. Uh, clearly uh, a taxing time for California. And to help uh, move this conversation uh, into action, I'm very pleased to introduce the chairman of the Bay Area Council, Mary Huss, uh, who also just happens to be the president and publisher of the San Francisco Business Times and the Silicon Valley Business Journal. Uh, Mary, please uh, take it away and uh, enjoy everyone and we'll have opportunity for questions and so forth. Uh, please participate, thank you. Well, thank you, Jim, and good morning, everyone, and to our panelists. So, Jim, I, I heard you say something once, and one of our reporters turned it into a headline, and you asked, is it taxes or Texas? Uh, we're finding that many of our businesses and people are beginning to vote with their feet. At any rate, as you say, Jim, we certainly have major challenges ahead of us, which makes the Bay Area Council's work and the support of our many members more important now than ever before. To help us better understand these fiscal and economic challenges and how we can move California forward without destroying our economy and the businesses and investors and workers that power it, uh, today we're going to hear from three insightful leaders who have deep knowledge of just how some of these taxing policies might pencil out. So I will tell you something about each one of them. Dick Kovacevic is the former CEO and chairman of Wells Fargo Bank, who guided the bank's growth during the late 1990s and early 2000s, and has become an outspoken champion of strengthening California's economic competitiveness. David Crane is a former financial services executive, top economic advisor to Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, and um, as president for of Govern for California is currently a leading advocate for reforming California's broken public pension and retirement benefit system. Jim Wallace is CEO of BPM, 
one of the 50 largest public accounting and advisory firms in the country. And Jim um, was recently recognized as one of Accounting Today's 2020 Managing Partner Elite and works with many of the companies um, that would be hit hardest by new taxes. I'm gonna give Jim Wallace a little bit of credit for, um, this, for this program this morning. He contacted Jim Wonderman and me and asked about a proposed income tax increase and asked if we'd done the math and what are we doing about it? So uh, thanks for uh, spurring us on on a subject that the Bay Area Council is deeply invested in. And thanks to our speakers all for joining us today. So I'm gonna lead off with a question for, uh, for Dick Kovacevic. And Dick, I know you're passionate about this. You said recently in a San Francisco Business Times interview that this state could implode within a generation. That's a dark outlook, Dick. Maybe even darker than the skies yesterday. Um, what's behind those ominous words that have you so concerned? Well, thank you, uh, Mary. Good morning, uh, everyone. Um, let me start with uh, something I think we can all agree on, and that is that uh, uh, California has a lot going for it. It is a home to the largest uh, ethnic, uh, ethnically diverse population in the United States. Uh, uh, people love living here. Uh, it's got a mild Mediterranean climate, uh, hundreds of miles of Pacific Ocean beaches, mountains, parks, recreation areas, ski resorts, world-class universities and cultural institutions. It's the technology center of the world. So why is it that given all these reasons uh, that people love being here, might California implode? And if they don't make some changes now, and why are so many people leaving California? I think there are, are many reasons, and I'll take a few minutes to, to, to delete, uh, uh, delineate some of these, but certainly it starts uh, with uh, taxes. It's a major issue. The, ca the California personal tax rate, which uh, generates almost 68% of all California taxes re tax revenue, so it's very important, is the highest in the country. It is dysfunctional, extremely progressive, volatile, and overly dependent on the wealthy, more so than any other state. According to the California Taxpayer Association in 2016, the top 5%, only 5% of the state's earners accounted for two thirds of the personal tax revenue. The top 1%, 50% of the revenue, 90% of Californians only contributed 22% to that revenue. 60%, 2.4%, and essentially half of the population pays no personal income taxes. A significant share of this revenue comes from stock options, a, a lot from technology companies that's dependent on a strong and ever increasing stock market. The market falls, the tax revenue declines significantly. If the wealthy leave the state, their tax revenue leaves with them. A Wall Street Journal survey confirms that the exodus risk is real as 42% of tech workers say that they would move to another state if they were allowed to do so. We have examples going on every day now. So many people are leaving that apartment rents in the Bay Area are down 20% because of so many vacancies. U-Haul trailer rates are less than half coming to California than those leaving because more, of course, are leaving than coming. And even with the lockdown, if you live here in, in, in San Francisco, there's a lot of congestion on the, on the San Francisco streets as moving vans are everywhere, double parked and blocking driving lanes. This exodus, I think, started in 2013 after Governor Jerry Brown led the charge to increase the highest tax rate from less than 10% to 13.3%. He said it would last seven years and the revenues would be spent only on education. Not surprisingly, the tax increase was extended until 2030 recently, and funds were used to increase spending for pensions and health care for retired teachers, not for student needs, not for existing teachers, and not to improve school performance. 
A study by Josh Rell, a professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and a fellow at the Hoover Institution, found that in just the first two years after the tax increase, enough wealthy people moved out and or shifted their tax residency to a more friendly uh, state so that the income raised was 45% less in additional tax revenue than was projected. Since the exodus of the wealthy continues, it is likely no or very little extra revenue has uh, been collected because, they're, uh, uh, because we're now in 220, eight years later. Uh, if the current tax rate that's on the table is increased to 16.8%, it is almost certain that tax revenue will actually decrease, not increase. There's only two states who have a personal tax rate in double digits in the United States of America. Hawaii at 11% and, and New Jersey at 10.75%. So Californians can, can pay a lot less in state taxes by moving to any state in the union. And some states that they are, uh, that they are moving to have no personal tax rate, such as Texas, Florida, Washington, and close by Nevada. Now, why would any sane politician who cares about California and its future increase taxes that results in less revenue collected, other than they could be reelected? California unions and some politicians have suggested not only to increase the highest rate to 16.8%, but to also add a 0.4% wealth tax. No other state imposes a wealth tax. Some European countries attempted to introduce a wealth tax recently. They quickly ditched it as too many rich people were, prepare were preparing to leave. What does California know that France doesn't? I believe a wealth tax is a red line that will cause a stampede of wealth, uh, wealthy people leaving the state even more than left the state as a result of the personal tax increase. Also being contemplated is a tax on unrealized capital gains that no other state in a nation has. So taxes are a big deal. Other issues that uh, we'll be talking about today is the trillion dollar unfunded pensions and healthcare. And if we don't do pension reform, in my opinion, California will very likely implode in a generation or two. California also has the most onerous business and housing regulations in the United States, the highest cost of living. Surveys of CEOs say California is the worst state in the country to do business. California has the highest re, uh, utility rates. Home builders say that the cost of building homes in California is 40 to 50% higher than the neighboring states they build in due to onerous regulations and delays in permits due to legal and environmental issues. Because small businesses often pay personal tax rates, not corporate tax rates, and, and are impacted by the, more by the onerous and excessive business regulations, uh, they continue to leave and move their operations to more friendly states. Unions influence California politics perhaps more than any other state. We have more homeless uh, residing in, Cal in California than in any other state. According to a national survey, San Francisco has the worst streets in need of repairs than any other large city in the United States. New York uh, uh, Governor Cuomo seems to understand the high tax wealthy exodus situation. When regulators came to him suggesting that New York should increase the tax rates on the rich to offset the state budget deficit, Cuomo was quoted as saying, we can't do that. Even more rich people will leave the state than have already left and our revenue will go down, not up. He said, I want the rich people to come back and I will take them out to dinner. Cuomo gets it. Will the politicians in California wake up also? If not, they're ignoring the facts as Cal at California's peril. Thank you, Mary. Well, thank you. Well, I thought I was depressed yesterday. <laughs> the sun never came out. So uh, Jim Wallace, you work with so many companies and executives who are struggling in the current economy. Some of them are not, but they're gonna be hit the hardest by new taxes being proposed. So I'm curious what you're hearing from your clients. 
Um, yeah, I'd be happy to share some of those stories. I want to make a quick comment on one of the things Dick said about people moving. Another factor I think we need to consider is the, the delta between staying and moving has never been smaller. So with working from home because of COVID, with uh, people already working, you know, I spent two months this summer working in Michigan, um, that ability to relocate has never been more easier or more likely. So even things from a year ago when we might have predicted gloom and doom and said people are going to leave the state, it is far more likely today because we're all practicing it. I practiced it myself this summer, right? I practiced in preparation for leaving the state and working. So it just I just want to point out that, that delta has never been smaller and as a result of COVID and working from home and the use of technology that we've all gotten used to. But to your question, Mary, yes, um, thank you. Thank you for including me. And, and um, I would share stories that we have heard. You know, um, I, ch I chatted with some of our um, uh, pri private client services tax partners. Those are our high, high net worth clients. Uh, Dick mentioned the, um, the stock options. Those, these are the people who are receiving these options and, and, and uh, doing very well because of that. And um, the number one question in the last nine to 12 months before these proposals you know, were even announced, um, are what does it take to move out of state? How do I do that? How do, what are the rules around that? Um, it's been the number one question in that group from our tax clients now for, for the last year, nine to 12 months. Um, one, just a couple of quick examples. We have one uh, uh, business, well, well um, very successful business with a large group of executives. Um, of that large group, 75% moved out of the state in the last four months. So um, one of them to out of the country but the rest have moved out of the states. And that's not a story that's unique. We have another uh, CFO kind of group that we chat with and meet with regularly. And they were talking, most of these folks were from Marin County where I live. And they were talking and um, sharing stories about um, the number of people that they know leaving Marin and how that's become so much more common. Another telltale sign is, is investment brokers and advisors. So we're getting more and more questions. It's a big referral source for us. We're getting more and more questions from investment advisors about two things. You know, what is it? They want a checklist. How do you move out of the state? And, and what are the rules and regulations around that? And how do you maximize your savings by moving out of the state? They want to know that for themselves and their people inside their business and specifically, what's the impact if their clients stay in California and they leave? But they're also asking on behalf of their clients because they're beginning to advise that the best way to manage your wealth is not to be in California. Um, and as a wealth manager, that's part of your job. Um, so that, that's become more and more a common question. And last, the last story I will share is just more and more um, companies are talking um, COS is seeking advice about the nuances of different organizational structures. And if you're set up one way versus another, which way best supports your employees who have chosen to leave the state? So if a CEO leaves, does the CEO necessarily move the company? I mean, I'm just, I'm thinking there's wealthy people and then there's all the people they impact or that they bring with them or that yep. So, so we're certainly seeing that, right? We're seeing not necessarily simultaneously, but the um, certain key executives begin uh, to matriculate and then the, um, then the company tends to follow afterwards, but there certainly are organized moves, but a lot of it's, is, it's one, then two, now it's four, now it's six. Well, now why not move the whole headquarters? Okay, well, why not move the manufacturing plant and so on? And then, and then we're not even talking about the ripple effect um, I'm sorry, I have a really large dog and he wants my attention. Um, and we have a ripple effect of, of people who then, you know, what does that do to property taxes? What does that do to sales taxes? What does that do to all the other taxes um, that we're not even kind of talking about in the scope of things if people stop buying their boats and they stop buying, you know, how, where, where does, those are all other sources of revenue, which we're losing as well. Great, thank you. And David, uh, you know, as Dick said, and, and many observers point to massive unfunded public pension and post-retirement benefit obligations as a major reason cities and counties are looking at tax increases. So how big a threat is this? And um, kind of give us the numbers and tell us what's ahead. Uh, well, Mary, uh, it's not a threat. It, it's already happening. Um, 
And uh, to make it even worse than what Dick said at the beginning, we weren't even, we taxpayers were not getting value for our money even before the tax increase in 2012. Let me show you what's happened to spending in California this last decade. Justin, can you put up the first slide? So uh, uh, th this is compound annual growth rates for uh, different categories of spending as uh, next to revenue growth. And the, um, this is since 2000, and the, the state's on a fiscal year that runs July 1 to June 30th, and this is the state. Uh, and you can see revenues grew at a very healthy rate of 5.1% compounded annually through uh, 2019. Um, but you saw uh, less than that growth in discretionary programs like public health, which is critically important today, as we all know, courts, UC and CSU, because there was dramatically higher growth in spending on retirement, which is composed of two things, pensions and retiree health care, um, which is otherwise known as OPEP, other post-employment benefits. Medi-Cal, now one out of three Californians is covered by Medicaid, which covers people up to 138% of the poverty level. And to give you a sense of the inefficiency of that spending, the state has doubled spending on Medi-Cal from 50 to 100 billion a year since 2010 with no improvement in public health. And that study was done by Mark Duggan, who now runs CEPR, the Stanford Institute of Economic Policy Research. He did that study for the National Bureau of Economic Research and Mark served in the Obama administration and worked on Obamacare. Um, one thing that has improved, by the way, over that period is hospital operating margins, which we can come back to. Uh, that's one of the other spending categories that has to be addressed. CDCR is prisons. Um, to give you a sense of the inefficiency of spending there, there are 57,000 employees in that department. They supervise fewer than 125,000 inmates. They were already the highest paid prison guards in the country in 2010. Your legislature and governor have given them six salary increases since then. The revenues that those 57,000 employees will collect is, is about $10 billion this year in terms of comp and benefits, which is about five times more than the revenues of the largest private prison corporation in the United States. So that spending that I'm pointing to there was baked in even before the tax increase in 2012. And when I got kicked off by the state Senate of the California State Teachers Retirement System in 2006 for pointing out that this was going to happen because they weren't addressing unfunded pension liabilities, virtually everybody was quiet about it, including the business community, which has a major, which is in a very significant way responsible for the situation that we're in today. Justin, can you go to the next slide? This is the math that matters to legislators. Dick mentioned how legislators care, you know, why would a legislator want to raise taxes uh, when they know that it produces less revenue and they also know that the revenue that's coming in is being sucked out by spending on legacy costs like pensions and retiree health care or going to boost operating margins at hospitals rather than improving public health. Well, the reason is, is that the only people that, they've been, that have been paying attention to them in Sacramento are those who largely get paid out of the state budget. So the state this year will spend $300 billion, including federal funds. Roughly 70 cents of every dollar will go out either to a government employee, like a prison guard, or California Highway Patrol, or teacher, or a healthcare corporation. Um, those organizations pay attention to the legislature. And by the way, you can't blame them because you too would pay attention if you were collecting, for example, as a prison guard, your organization was collecting $10 billion a year in compensation and benefits. Well, they donate, it's like a mispriced security. They donate next to nothing to legislators. Um, and as you can see from this slide, or actually go to the next one, Justin, it'll make it even clearer. The total amount, and let me see if I can see the slide here. I got it. So CCPOA is the, is the prison guards. Um, they, uh, there are lots of colors there. They donated, well, in all cases, much less than a million dollars a year, all of those years, and they collect $10 billion a year. CTA is the California Teachers Association. The most that anybody can give a legislator is $9,400 
per election cycle, which is two years for, a leg for an assembly member, four years for a senator. Legislators need that money in their accounts in order to boost their own power within the legislature. And if any of you ever read Robert Caro's books on Lyndon Johnson, you would understand that that's the way a legislator can become more powerful and like Johnson eventually become majority leader. That is the math that legislators pay attention to. Um, now my organization, Government for California has been involved uh, since 2011 and it's since 2017, we have been a major donor to legislators and now we are the largest donor to legislators. But I will tell you, the legislators, and rightly so, doubt the staying power of political philanthropists like us. They also doubt the staying power of businesses because you go in and out on specific issues and you don't stay there permanently the way the unions and the healthcare corporations do. So the point that I'm making to all of you today is the only way any of this will change is if you get involved in your state legislature and your local government as well and provide the same support to them that those who are uh, wreaking the benefits from state spending are, are, are reaping. Thank you. So David, just as a follow-up, when, when we see a tax measure go on the ballot and it's labeled as something, you know, sometimes I think Prop 15 has a, a label, you know, the split, the split roll tax. Yeah. Um, what we have to do is peel the onion back and see how much of that is really going to that particular cause. Is that what you're saying? No, um, I'm, no. saying, I'm saying even more than that. Yeah. Um, it's too late by the time it gets to the ballot because it's yeah. something that Dick or Jim said, I, maybe nobody mentioned it, but it's very easy to pass tax increases in California when most people don't pay taxes. So by the time it gets to the ballot where you only need 50% plus one vote, you're already at a great disadvantage. And, and if you're playing defense like that, you're going to lose, especially if you never address the the four horsemen of the California fiscal apocalypse, which are pensions, retiree health care, inefficient spending on Medi-Cal, and prisons. So you are 100% right. Politicians will constantly name these measures, and they get approval from the attorney general who's in charge of writing title and some approving title and summary for initiatives. They essentially lie. For the 2012 tax increase, Prop 30, that Dick mentioned Governor Brown and the legislature put on the ballot and had the approval of the State Chamber of Commerce and a number of other business organizations around the state was sold as a measure to boost spending, to boost uh, you know, schools and that sort of thing. More than 100% of the benefit of that tax increase, which was, as Dick pointed out, not as great as they all projected it would be, more than 100% of the benefit for schools went out in increased spending on pensions and retiree health care. So it's too late by the time the initiative gets to you. There's a very good chance initiatives will pass. So uh, just specifically and quickly, um, maybe can you point out any of you the most, uh, the specific uh, maybe ballot measures that are tax, tax in nature that are on the November ballot that concern you the most? And I, and, um, or maybe some that are brewing um, with the legislature that may come, you know, uh, back to haunt us, so to speak. Anything specifically that you want to bring up? Well, I'll jump in and tell you that not a single one of those measures should pass until the horsemen are the horses are corralled, because the money will go to increase spending on legacy costs uh, and for special interests. It doesn't translate into increased services, so every one of them should fail. Um, you asked about the legislature, the bills that were introduced this year, which my organization played a, a role in defeating behind the scenes, those are dead for the year. The income tax increase, AB 1253, by Miguel Santiago, who, by the way, doesn't even necessarily believe in that tax increase. But in his district, in California, he's got to protect against a, a challenge from somebody to his left, uh, a Bernie Sanders supporter, for example, just the way Scott Weiner has to defend against Jackie Fielder in San Francisco. Um, that measure is dead this year. You can get bet your bottom dollar, it'll come back next year. Uh, the same thing is true of AB 2088, which is the wealth tax increase. That's proposed by Rob Bonta, who represents Alameda County. In his district, that sells very well. He also wants to avoid a challenge from the left. He also received money from the California Federation of Teachers that wrote 
essentially the wealth tax increase that is embodied in his bill. That bill is dead this year. You can bet your bottom dollar it and much more will come back next year. And all of that will continue until the costs get, con get controlled. And by the way, even then it will continue because unions and others can put measures on, uh, on the ballot with relative ease and then pass them. So this all happens because we are not, we have all not been diligent enough in our own democracy in, in fighting the opposition. And, and I'll just liken it for this business community to a mispriced security for, a, for value investors. The amount of money that is necessary to play in this game is not that great, but you have to do it persistently. All right, so Dick, um, you can respond if there's anything specific uh, that you wanna talk about, but just what are the changes that you wanna see, the most specific changes to ensure California does not implode? Well, I agree with David. I mean, I just don't see how you can raise enough revenue uh, to not only pay all your day-to-day -day expenses that exist here and pay back $1 trillion of unfunded, already retired uh, pensioners and healthcare. You have to reform the pension. There is no other way. Uh, uh, this is just math. And, uh, you know, uh, Governor Brown said he was going to reach, you know, re uh, reform pensions. He, in he ultimately increased the pensions <laughs> and, and I said, passed an initiative that basically did not help education at all. It paid for pensions. So to me, uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, that's a credit card debt. <laughs> That, that just gets you back to zero again. And so that's number one. And, and of course, the other three things that, that uh, David mentioned. Uh, but, but also, you know, we have to, we have to be honest about th these things. Uh, again, why would you put something on the ballot that decreases the revenue when you're saying it's going to increase? And we can't let people get away with this, uh, uh, and and the populace. And and I know it, it, it's hard. It you know, um, you know maybe we're going to lose, but we got to go down fighting. It seems to me because uh, this. I, I don't want to be overly dramatic. The numbers are such that it will implode. And 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 the reason all these things are important is we already see it happening in other states. We, have, we see it in Illinois, we see it in New York, we, we see it in New Jersey, we see it in Connecticut. Both the fact that you can't raise taxes because people will leave, and that you've got these pension issues and unfunded liabilities, that, that the only way you can pay them back is with increased revenue. And, all, and so you put those together, and what you get is those, those uh, states are gonna implode. So, these, th this effort is not only important for California, it's important for America to address these issues uh, before, because the sooner we do it, the better off we'll be. Thank you. I do wanna remind our audience to use the Q&A uh, function if you have questions to send our way. I just got, somebody just sent through a strong agree to what you said, uh, Dick. And uh, Jim, you know, you have some, you had your economist has done some interesting modeling, uh, kind of showing what happens when taxes, if they go up and what happens, does it drive high earners out? So explain some of that, Jim. All right, um, I'd love to, I'm gonna share my screen. We practiced this earlier, so we should be in good shape. Um, so Mary, give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. I can see it. Okay, yeah. well, that's good. <laughs> All right, so, um, oops, I'm gonna get that chat off there. Um, so this is just a brief, a little background. I'll try to be very quick about this and then we'll get to the actual spreadsheet. So there's, there's currently a, a, a million 422 millionaires in the state of California. Um, they typically grow between three and 5%. We use a, a rate of 3% because of the COVID and other challenges we thought we might have with the economy. Um, if less than 289,000 uh, of those millionaires leave the state of California, 
uh, for example, to, to Dick's uh, point a moment ago, um, <clears throat> Prop 1253 is underwater pretty much from the, from the start in terms of how things would look over a four year period. Um, and I'll show you that in a, in a spreadsheet in a moment. Um, if more than uh, 289,000 millionaires or just 7.8% of the millionaires leave the state, um, you know, the, the, the new revenue generated is underwater almost from the, from the start. And so just to, to point out that, you know, it was already, the comment was made earlier about the percentage. So uh, 45 to 55% of the overall personnel, uh, of, of the overall income tax is paid um, for by a very small percentage of our population. And so any movement in that percentage um, is likely to have a significant impact on, um, on the revenue. So here's, an here's the revenue. So right now this is showing the a 5%. If we have 5% of the millionaires leave the state per year, and that's including a 3% growth rate. Um, so really kind of a, a net 2% uh, departure rate. So in year one, we do generate positive tax, um, but you can see by year three, it's already flipped. And by year four, again, just at a 5% departure rate, net 2% departure rate, we are already upside down. So to Dick's point, we're, we're not generating any tax. And then I think to tie in a little bit, I, I, you know, David's mentioned that really the best way to influence legislators become involved, I agree with that 100%. Uh, but if, if it doesn't turn fact flip, and we're not generating the revenue, but we've become accustomed to that revenue that's generated here in the early years, that's gonna to have to be picked up somewhere else. So it's gonna to have to be another tax increase or a broader tax increase or some other form to generate the revenue necessary um, to do that. And then we did just um, dropped in the uh, 2088 as well and to see the impact of the wealth tax, which again, from a CPA perspective, we don't even know how you would begin to enforce that when, when we look at the the number of variables in determining someone's wealth. You know, how, how do you value a, a used yacht or, or artwork um, that, that's maintained in a different state or, you know, it could be a real boom for my profession in terms of the role we might get to play, but we don't see exactly how that makes any sense. Um, you see again that the, the, the turn rate changes quickly and just real quick and then I'll let you go back to you, Mary. Um, you know, if you if you just if you have a ten percent uh, switch, so again a net change of seven percent, it's upside down in year one, and again that goes back to that delta I'm talking about. I feel like the the space between people rooted in California and staying here, and what it would take them to leave the state has never been narrower because they've already have been practicing with COVID. They've already been doing it. People like me have already spent months away and they already own another home and so on. Um, and so that, that um, piece of it, I think has never been closer in terms of what uh, the incentive for people to leave. And if you think about the wealthiest people in our state, they already own wherever they're gonna go to. They already have their home in Utah or, or their ranch in Texas or their, it's not like they have to do a lot to get there. They already own that spot and they're already on their way. I, I have a, a client of mine who's uh, moved to his home in Utah that he's owned for 10 years. And he, you know, he's like, well, I'm just going to go to Utah then now. And so he spends the bulk of his time in Utah at the home he already had. And so that that's the math, which was what my original question was. We, we've learned a lot um, from David and Dick and a lot deeper into the underlying issues, which are extremely important. But my original question to you was, does the math even work? And I don't think it does. I don't think the math even works. So I think the whole concept that we're trying to raise taxes, well, no matter what you, where you are on the political spectrum, um, I think the concept is flawed right from the beginning. Great, thanks for, for sharing that. We certainly hear a lot of the stories that you're talking about um, anecdotally of people leaving or, or uh, voting with their feet, I'm really interested in ways to quantify that as well. Um, I'm gonna, David, I'm gonna get to you with sort of a follow-up to that, but I, I wanted to, a uh, couple of comments from our audience. Uh, somebody suggests that we need Governor Newsom to be part of the session today, and Jim needs to send him a copy, and I'm sure you will, Jim, of this webinar. And uh, that was from Hans, Corvey, and then Michael Covarrubias uh, says in San Francisco and elsewhere, 
no one demands economic analysis to put measures on the ballots, we should pass legislation to require each such analysis, and so why don't we? I'm gonna let you, there's another question I'll get to in a minute, but I, um, David, I might have you respond to that as you respond to um, this question, uh, which is you know, related to all of the decisions um, relating to the budget and economy of the state coming out of Sacramento and to get more into politically what's behind the proposals um, that would entertain taxes that we might consider risky. Uh, it seems short-sighted. Short so who do we need to educate and change the mind that's influencing things the most? You need 62 members of the state legislature. They're 120, there are 80 in the assembly, 40 in the Senate. Uh, measures pass on a majority vote with uh, 62 votes and then and the governor's signature. Governors tend to sign, it, the legislature considers up to 4,500 bills a year. This year was truncated. They pass on average about 1,000. Governors on average sign about 80% of them. Um, most legislators, uh, and uh, most people, for example, the gentleman that said we have to get this in front of the governor, governors don't have that much power, uh, California in particular. Uh, it's one of the first things I learned when I went to Sacramento with Governor Schwarzenegger, and to his surprise, he learned. Um, Sure. You could be Abe Lincoln, and uh, you'll have next to no power unless you can get 62 votes in the assembly, uh, in the legislature, on anything. Um, it's not like you know foreign policy where you can do some things without Congress. Uh, in fact, in California's constitution, the legislature comes before the the executive branch, uh, so governors really can't do anything without those votes, and they can stop things, but that doesn't get you very far. Um, so, and then, you, and then you, you go up there and you learn you don't even know all the legislators, but you find out that there are three groups who do know all the legislators really well. Group number one are those I mentioned earlier who collect the lion's share of $300 billion a year of spending. So the teachers unions, the prison guards union, uh, uh, the healthcare corporations. Group number two are the crony capitalists. Uh, they're the ones who, the, 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 there are 29 legal codes written by the legislature and approved by the governor. They're, they're largely coders, you know, the labor code, the education code, the environmental code, the business and professions code, uh, you know, Lyft and, and DoorDash and Uber didn't know anything about any of those codes until five years ago, they learned about the business and professions code. And um, those codes, uh, the, the crony capitalists, uh, for example, we're engaged in a war right now with the California Medical Association, which represents only about a third of California doctors on a bill to liberate nurse practitioners. Liberating nurse practitioners to practice to the full extent of their training in California, we're the only Western state that doesn't allow that. They're tethered by law in a sort of a feudal fashion to doctors to whom they have to pay tribute. That limits access and raises costs in California. The nurse practitioners have tried for 13 years to get that bill passed. This year, we got behind it. It passed the legislature. We are hoping and praying that the governor will sign it. Um, there's not a single legislator we've ever met who thinks it's a good idea to tether nurse practitioners to doctors and limit access. But the reason they've been afraid to change it all these years is because the California Medical Association, I showed them on that graph, are regular contributors to legislators. So you talk of, Mary, you said, who do you have to educate? Actually, you have to educate yourselves and this audience because they haven't been paying attention to the right people. If you want to influence legislators, you have to understand what they are doing and provide them with perpetual support. And that is the only chance, in my view, that you have to get California governed in a successful way. And I'll just make it even worse for you. California has already imploded. If you're a parent in the Sacramento Unified School District, where there are 42,000 kids, they started laying off teachers last year before COVID, despite record revenues. State spending on schools in California has grown at the fastest pace in the United States the last five years. Yet they were laying off teachers last year. And under California law, they're laid in last in, first out, regardless of performance. Uh, and the reason they're laying them off is because of they're spending $27 million a year on retiree healthcare subsidies for teachers who don't even need those subsidies 
because they're already entitled to Medicare or state subsidies or Obamacare, et cetera. To me, that's implosion if I'm a parent and my kids are losing their teachers. So it's a little bit more like a frog being slowly boiled to death is what's happening in California. And in my view, you ain't seen nothing yet uh, unless uh, we corral the four horsemen of the fiscal apocalypse and, and also reform the education code, et cetera. Dick, that sounds like music to, well, not music to your ears, but it, it sounds like uh, he's singing your song. How would you respond in terms of who we most need to influence? I mean, what are we gonna do to turn this tide? Well, uh, I, I think there are, are two steps. Uh, and you know, the politicians created this and the politicians could fix it. You know, it, it didn't happen on the outside. It, you know, it wasn't a pandemic. It wasn't a worldwide uh, uh, depression or recession. Uh, they made these laws uh, that cause uh, 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 expenses to grow faster than revenues and and they have to reverse those laws they have to say okay how do we increase revenues to support all the things we have how do we quit losing wealthy people leaving the state businesses wealth in the state what do we have to do to keep them uh, as Jim pointed out uh, it's not only the personal taxes that leave. It's all the other taxes, the, the other 22, uh, 32% that are leaving. And, and, and that group, that wealthy group tends to increase their revenues, tax revenues every year because they're growing and, uh, and, and investing, etc. So we got to stop the door. And, and, and then we have to say, how can we increase it? So keep stop them from leaving. And then how do we get more uh, people in this state that are paying, that can pay taxes? That, that, because as I said at the beginning, this is one of the greatest states in the union. We've got everything in, in terms of natural resources and, and you know, close to Asia, which is what's growing. Uh, people want to live here. It's, it's good weather and so on. It's being ruined uh, by Sacramento, basically. And, and so the answer is Sacramento. When, when will they wake up? and do what's best for California, not best, for, uh, what they think may be best for their uh, uh, reelection, but you know, eventually the population is gonna wake up and throw them out uh, one way or another. So we've got a series of questions that more or less relate to the same thing. You know, it's, it's about, um, they understand the merit of discussing the loss of tax revenue um, but uh, how to move in the other direction and expand um, the tax base, state and local, and, uh, and ideas for, uh, to seriously consider um, pro productive proposals. So a little bit more on, um, on productive solutions, you know, to try to turn the, uh, to try to turn the tide. And are there strategic ideas for expanding the pie? Um, rather than um, spend, so. Well, I can, I can address that. The, okay. There are plenty of ideas. And in fact, uh, in 2009, we had a tax reform commission uh, chaired by Jerry Parsky that uh, came up with, um, and I was the liaison between that commission and Governor Schwarzenegger that came out with a solution uh, that would reduce the personal income tax, make uh, uh, our revenues much less volatile, uh, impose a business net receipts tax, which, which is a bit of a VAT. Um, it was dead on arrival. We knew it was going to be dead on arrival even before they got done with it. It was dead on arrival because nobody in the legislature is going to go there. And by the way, the business community didn't like it. Th this is another example. Business community, even though it would have dropped per individual income tax rates, the business community didn't want to see, you know, a business net receipts tax, which would have been very, you know, non-volatile and, and a, a stable tax base. The issue isn't ideas. For example, pension reform, it, it's all political. There's only one state in the country that has done serious pension reform. That's Rhode Island under a Democratic governor, Rhode I, uh, Gina Raimondo, who's the most courageous politician in the United States. Uh, I've had her come out and, and address our legislators in California. Um, it's a war 
and no other state has really gotten it done. So I, it, I'm going to make your day even worse. Even if you get all the power, the war to get it all done inside the legislature, you are talking about taking on the Wehrmacht, as I like to put it. Um, and I, it, you know, us defeating the California Medical Association on the nurse practitioner's bill is like defeating the Italian army in World War II. Defeat, winning on pensions, retiree health care, those sorts of issues, the prison guard salary increases is like defeating the Wehrmacht. And they've been active for like four decades while the rest of us have been asleep. So this conversation about like ideas is not the issue or even to Dick's point about politicians waking up in Sacramento, they are wide awake. And they are paying attention to exactly the interests that they should be paying attention to the way we all did in business. In, in Dick, when you were running Wells Fargo, you were paying attention to your customers like me. When I was in business, I was paying attention to my customers. Every day I woke up, you know, how do we win? How do we make money this year? How do we net income? How do we control our costs? Well, their incentives are the same up there. How do I get reelected? Which by the way, virtually all of them are gonna get reelected because there's a big incumbency advantage in California. And then they're termed out after 12 years and they're gonna move on to something else. So they're looking at who's gonna help them. If you, if you look, for example, at the chair of the Appropriations Committee, who was the, who, who uh, uh, Lorena Gonzalez, who was the author of AB5, which is the, you know, the bill that is hated by so many people, I'm sure, in this audience. Lorena's gonna run for Secretary of State. Her focus has been collecting money from people who are gonna help her win that race. By the way, we donated to her because we needed her support on a number of bills because she's chair of the Appropriations Committee. So the people that need to wake up are you. If you're gonna be in this war, you have to fight it to win. You can't do it with just gatherings like this or cocktail party conversations or going in and out of it. It's a democracy and it's just what Benjamin Franklin said. You know. You know, the, the, the apocryphal story about how when Ben Franklin was walking back from the Constitutional Convention and the citizens of Philadelphia said, Mr. Franklin, what kind of, gov or Dr. Franklin, whatever, what kind of government did you deliver us? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. So the answer is everybody else that's feeding at the trough and the crony capitalists, they pay attention. You don't get in the war. And by the way, if you've got a better idea than we have, do it. But you got to get off the sidelines. Mary, can I uh, make a, ask a, a, a question of David? Uh, because I was surprised about what I would describe as how little money is needed to to make a big uh, to have a big voice in in California. So, David, what? How much total money? Do you think an organization like yourself or multiple organizations need to consistently have available to be able to counter the others and have a major voice? It's going to shock you how little it is. And by the there way, it is. We, would like, we would like nothing more than to see other people get into this field. This field. It's lonely for us. And we're a network of 800 members. We have 15 local chapters, uh, which is a way of, it's like a, a force multiplier, if you will. And they, they're constantly donating money to legislators. You dribble it out just the way the special interests do. SEIU, the union, which is very powerful, donates less than a million dollars a year, but dribbles it out. So the amount of money you need, it's tiny. Uh, 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 Justin, pull Give us up. Some numbers. It's like a million dollars. It's less than a million dollars a year but you got to do it forever. And, and by the way, sustained. by the um, way, the only the, the, you can only give, it's limited. So everybody always talks about rich people doing it and you know plutocrats and billionaires. No, no, you can only give ninety four hundred dollars per legislator per election cycle and seventy eight hundred dollars per committee. So friends of the Bay Area Council, you know people like you can form your own committees. And you can each contribute $7,800 a year to it. And by the way, if you collect only $100,000 a year in that committee and dribble it out to legislators, year in and year out, at $100,000 a year, you'll be one of the largest PACs in Sacramento. It is an unbelievably mispriced security. Well, this is I'll, so I'll, important I'll, to people to understand. We're talking about small amount of money to make a big 
difference. Focused on the big. So I, I think we're going to have to do follow ups on this because there's so much more we can say. And, and Jim, I'm just going to say we need to do solution oriented uh, follow ups. As the chair, I think I can say those things. Um, but here's, I wanted to pop this question and it might fit with what you were just asking. Just that somebody asked from the audience, Frederick Band and Abiel. I just said, do you think Fortune 500 companies, the big companies based in California, are being vocal enough? You know, are they just, you know, we've had a couple head out. Are they, are they being vocal enough? Are they making a difference? How could they be? So maybe I could take a shot. You at want this. to jump at that I one? I want to thank the panelists for the discussion. We got to, we got to wrap, we, don't we? <laughs> we, got, we got to wrap pretty quick. Uh, you know, I think there's been, I've observed over my career, a diminution of influence and effect by the business community in California, as well as locally. And I think that to David Crane's point, that, you know, the, 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 the side of the folks who are representing the spend it, you know, the, they get the money from the state and so they're very organized, have done a good job of keeping uh, business on the defensive. And I think it is absolutely warranted at this point for the business community to reorganize itself because what we've shown, I think, in this seminar today is that, you know, we're at a, we're at a tipping point. Uh, you know, this, you know, we can't sustain the budget of the state and improve and provide the kind of services people demand because the money's going to things, you know, that are out of our control and these retirement costs that have been negotiated over a long period of time and now have to be undone and it's not an easy thing to do. I think we've also lost focus on public administration. You know, we're not looking deeply into how money gets spent, how effectively it is. There's really very little talk about that. There's been a change in journalism, I'm talking to a journalist, but it used to be a lot more investigative journalism into the way uh, money was, was, uh, was provided and how it was utilized. And you know, we've seen a lot less of that lately. You know, I think it's, it's uh, I think I take the criticism that David, you know, put out. It's on us. You, know, you got to look in the mirror. You know, what are we doing? And I think it's time for us, you know, we, we are civic, we're not just businesses, we're civic leaders of the state and we've got to step up. Uh, you know, that's the purpose of the Bay Area Council in the interest of not just business, but the public and answer this question about how we get more investment in the future. How do we get businesses to feel like California is the place they want to stay, they want to grow and they want to succeed in. And if the gun is pointed at your head like it is in San Francisco with these three taxes just aimed at business, just in a really personal, visceral way, you know, you can't really expect people to and think positively. They're going to do what Jim Wallace is suggesting they are doing is looking for the answers. How do I get out of this place? That's a very dangerous situation that we're in. And anyone who's involved in these conversations, anecdotally these days, you know, people are really talking about this. And so I've urged legislators to, to you know, this isn't business as usual. You can't just keep doing this. You have to understand that you, you know, you're taking California to a place you're going to regret. So I think it's on uh, the Barrett Council historically has worked on regional issues, on transportation and housing and other issues. We've got to really focus on this business climate. That's why we held this group today. Uh, not as a finality, but to answer the question, what can we do? How can we assemble people? What are the right steps we can take? You know, how do we get the right information together so that we can make the case? And then how do we effectively make it with the people who actually make decisions? And I think the three panelists did a really good job of explaining some of that. And it's hard, but you know, I want to thank uh, you, you know, for doing this and Mary for, for really holding a good conversation. One hour is not nearly enough to get to the answers, but it is it is a great beginning. So I want to thank you every for participating in that. Thank you all, really, for great. By the way, we supported that nurses bill from the beginning, from nine years ago when it was first introduced. So we're celebrating that expansion of practice. Should have happened a long time ago, but at least it got through. So thank you, thank you for that. Governor, still has, big to deal. Governor still has to sign it. Well, that's right. <laughs> Hopefully. We'll Mary, I just want to be clear that I am not suggesting that anyone leave the state of California, only sharing the stories I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. I would suggest it. that everyone stay. We yeah. want everyone to stay. <laughs> this, stay is, and, this is a great part place. You know, the, part of our problem is people came to California. We doubled the population in not too long a time because it was the California dream. There were songs written. I want more songs. I want to hear some songs about California that are good. And articles in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times that are good. People are coming back. I want to come out of this pandemic with a new set of strategies. 
where people say, hey, we're, co we're coming back and we're going to make it better than ever, you know, for everybody. And that's what the that, that's what we've got to be about. And in order to do that, we got to get real with some of the things that have been brewing over these years that have put us in a position. Any business would look at its own uh, business, you know, it, it, you know, its situation and say, OK, we have to fix this. So I, I'm all for trying to fix it. And I need your help, this this audience and, and our membership and other folks to come together and join in the in this in this you know fight to kind of restore sanity and reasonableness to you know how we run the state government and local governments and you know get the people in office who really have the bigger interests in mind. Um, we don't want to control things as business. We want people with with good interests to run our state and run our governments. But um, a lot of work to do. Thank thanks everybody. Thank you, Mary. You did a thank great. Thank you all very, very much. Yeah, and we'll really. look forward to more great conversations. Keep up the good work, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right.